right, good evening. It's five o'clock. We'll go ahead and begin our evening worship tonight with our announcements. Give each, uh, give those that are finding a seat just a few seconds to do so. I want to welcome each one here tonight. If you're visiting, and we do have some visitors tonight, I, I see some in our audience. I want to want to welcome you tonight and so glad that you're here worshiping with us. If you're passing through or maybe you're new to the area or maybe you're not new to the area and you're you're visiting us tonight. We hope you feel welcome. This is a place that, that you should. You should feel welcome, and we hope you do, and we hope to meet you following worship tonight. I want to welcome those that are also perhaps watching online and worshiping there with us tonight. I want to ask you to, um, as we begin, maybe try to silence your cell phone if you have one, just to eliminate those distractions while we worship. Jimmy Garner is going to lead our singing tonight, and if you want to use a book, I think they will also be on PowerPoint behind me. First song is 321, 321 if you want to use the book. We'll go through these announcements and we'll look at those that are sick. This morning it was announced that Rory Bell has a co-worker. Uh, her first name is Mercy, I can't recall her last name, but works with Rory Bell and she was an automobile accident and ask for prayers for her and would would appreciate those prayers and in, in her recovery the only other individuals that I'm aware of that are on uh, the sick list to remember in prayer and, and recovering are in the bulletin Lois Bird who is Keisha Madison's mother is recovering from an open heart surgery that she had last week uh, she has an address in the bulletin if you'd like to send her a card of encouragement. Then Mackenzie O'Brien, Jim and Sharon's granddaughter will have surgery within the next few months to repair injuries that she received in an automobile accident. So remember those individuals in your prayer. Several others, of course, that continue to struggle uh, with health issues are there in the bulletin as well. Remember several events. Tonight we've got two events for all of our youth. We have for our 6th to 12th graders, the Teen Sing, which will be at the home of the Bolshevists immediately following worship tonight. We'll gather together and take the bus over to the Bolshevists' house and enjoy some, some food and fellowship and singing tonight with the Bolshevists. And then the Frogs night, which is 5th grade and down, will have, um, from what I understand, uh, games and pizza. And it sounds like a whole lot of fun. It'll be at, is it Kiwanis? Is that, is that correct? Park which is if you go out to uh, Red Wine and take a left where all the baseball fields are, there's a playground in the back. Don't know what else to say about how to get there. You'll find it. If you need any other instructions, see Donna uh, Hagen or, or Catherine Hopkins uh, as far as to get there. And that's tonight for all of our frog kids, and hope that's a lot of fun. SOAR, which is a youth rally for our 6th through 12th graders, will be this weekend in Augusta. Georgia. This is our first year to go. Super excited about it. Uh, we have several who have registered to go. Remember us in, in our travels going down to that. And if you're, you're registered to go, make sure that you pay the office uh, the, the, the money that is required to go to SOAR. And don't forget about it. We'll leave the building here at 430 on Friday. 430 on Friday. Kite Day be the end of the month, March 31st. A potluck following our morning worship, and then Kite Day. Several other events in the bulletin. There's some area-wide events. Don't forget, there will also be a, a Leaderette Tea Party, April 14th, 3 to 4.30, hosted by San, uh, Sandra Hopkins. If you have any uh, daughters and last leaders, see Sandra, the... Lads to Leaders Convention in Atlanta will be April 19th through the 21st to um, remember all of these events. Mexico Mission Trip, July 19th through the 27th, and several other events to consider. Uh, one more announcement before we begin our worship is that we need teachers. I'm looking at a lot of people who have a lot of potential, and if you want to be a teacher, maybe you've never been one, you can do it. I believe in you. Maybe you want to do it for the first time and, and take that step. We need you. Maybe you've done it before and you thought, well, somebody else can do it now. Well, we need you still. We need teachers. If you go to the Welcome Center out to the right of the auditorium, there's a big sign and a sign-up list. Put your name down 
And even if you wanted to maybe tag team with somebody, you say, well, I don't want to do it all by myself, but so-and-so over here will help me. Well, we just need good Bible class teachers. Please sign up for that and see Eric Hagen, who's our deacon over teachers, uh, for that. We'll begin with 321. It may be in the valley where countless dangers hide. It may be in the sunshine that I in peace abide. But this one thing I know, if it be dark or fair.
do everything that is pleasing to you. And if there is something that we are aware of, that you help us to see that so we can correct that. We also ask that you help us to open our hearts and minds and let your word sink deep into it. And let us meditate on the words of the message tonight. And let that open our hearts to something new that we haven't realized or noticed in the past. We ask that you be with those that are on our prayer list, those that have had ongoing health issues. We ask that you help their bodies to heal, help them to get back to a point where they can function and try to be back here with us again. We ask that you be with those that have recently lost loved ones or those who have gone through procedures, just heal them and comfort them and help us to be an encouragement to them. We thank you for your son and that gift he's given us. And we ask that you forgive us of our sins and help us to always try to stay away from the pitfalls and the traps and snares that the devil lays for us. And it's his name we pray.
choice of songs to go well with our study tonight. Take your Bible and turn to the book of Psalms, if you will. Specifically, Psalm 62. It's not a long psalm. But let me encourage you, let me invite you to read this together with me. And as you read, I want you to, I want you to listen for some key words, some key ideas that repeat as we go through these 12 verses. The New King James says, Truly, my soul waits silently for God. From Him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. How long will you attack a man? You shall be slain, all of you, like a leaning wall and a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his high position. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. That word selah is a, a, a musical notation term. It means to pause. And then the next verse or the next stanza begins, My soul, wait silently for God alone or for God only. For my expectation is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength, and my refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. And then he continues in the final stanza at verse 9, Surely men of low degree are a vapor. Men of high degree are a lie. If they are weighed on the scales, they are altogether lighter than vapor. Do not trust in oppression, nor vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. God has spoken once. Twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. Also to you, O Lord, belongs mercy, for you render to each one according to his work. Did you notice the contrast here? The contrast between David's trust and the trust of those whom he would describe as his enemies? We don't know with, with certainty what the, the setting for this psalm is, where it took place, when in his life David wrote this. But most scholars, most historians uh, generally agree they think that it probably dates from about the time of Absalom's rebellion. You remember that David had a son who actually started a war among the people trying to overthrow David and take his place. And at one point, David was forced to flee from the palace to, to run away from Jerusalem to avoid being murdered by his own son. The thought of, of most of the scholars that I have, have consulted and, and read about this is that Psalms 61 and 62 and 63 actually all go together and what you see here in Psalm 61 would be David leaving, David having to flee, having to run. And he goes out from Jerusalem across the Mount of Olives. And as he reaches the summit of the Mount of Olives, perhaps he turns and looks back at, at the palace, at the temple, at the city from which he's being forced to run away. And he pauses and in Psalm 62, then, we have the, the record of his, his thoughts and his appeal, his determination. He's confiding his troubles in God. And then, 
having done that, having, having been renewed by, in, in his confidence, by having done that in Psalm 63 then, he goes on in the confidence that God has heard him and God will sustain him whatever takes place. The point of the psalm here, 62, is to emphasize for us where David's trust and where David's confidence ultimately lay and how different it was for him, even at a low point in his life, compared to those who thought that they were on top of the world, in control of the situation, but only trusted in themselves and their own wisdom, even as they were seeking his life. What I'd like for us to do for a few minutes this, mo- this, this evening is to give some thought to these verses And consider who it is that we trust. When we encounter challenges, when we encounter trials in our own lives, who do we trust? Now I know that most of us are Christians and and we would would respond to that that whole thought with, well, I trust God, I trust in the Lord Jesus, I'm, 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 I'm right there with him. But before we mouth those words, let's pause and and think just how tempting it can be for us to actually do exactly what David's foes were doing here. And instead of trusting in God, trust in ourselves and our own wisdom. You see, the first thing we see in verses 1, 2, 3, and 4 is that David was committed to God even though he was being very cruelly attacked, even though he was being uh, harassed, even though he was being punished, if you will, by unrighteous men. Now, the fact of the matter is when you choose to live a genuinely Christian life, you're going to encounter some times when people oppose you just because of who you are. You're going to to have some experiences that uh, people will mock you, people will poke fun at you, people will sideline you or marginalize you, not include you, or, or maybe actively try to cause you harm just because of who you are. Now, we look at that and say, well, now, wait a minute, this is the United States of America, and they can't do that here. Well... Yes, they can. And folks do. The Apostle Paul was very plain when he wrote to Timothy and wrote in 2 Timothy chapter uh, chapter 3 in verse 12, Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus, what's going to happen to us if we do that? All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, shall experience, shall endure being harassed. Now, in our society, in our culture, uh, harassment is kind of benign, isn't it? Harassment in, in the United States toward Christians really probably takes the form more of, of mockery in television and print media than open persecution, but it's not that way in a large part of the rest of the world. There are places in the world where it's actually illegal for you to become a Christian. If you were not born into a so-called Christian religion, it's actually illegal for you to change your religion in some parts of the world. And if you do, you're liable to be punished for doing that. Some places even punished by death. But Paul was plain. There's a price tag attached to trusting in God. Jesus foretold the very same thing when he said to his his own apostles in John chapter 15 and verse 20. You might want to turn over there and just look at that. John 15 and verse 20. Jesus said there, remember. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. Huh? What are you getting at, Jesus? 
A servant is not greater than his master. And then he makes the application for us. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. He's talking about the way people react to the message of the gospel. He's talking about the way people respond to Christians in society. Some people will oppose your values. Some people will not want you to live your faith because it puts them on the spot. It singles them out. Others will appreciate what you stand for. And in that, both sides, the pro and the con, are simply treating us just as Jesus was treated. Think about that. Do do you ever pause and, and, and think, I'm being treated just like Jesus was? If you live a faithful Christian life, you will be. You'll be treated just like Jesus was. Go back into the Old Testament and you find in Jeremiah chapter 38 in verses 5 through 13 that Jeremiah, whose only crime was telling the truth, an unpopular truth, Jeremiah was thrown down into a a cistern basically, a, a hole, a dungeon that was filled with cold, wet mud simply because the message that he had from God was not what the king's advisors wanted the king to hear. See, it wasn't even the king that did it here. It was his advisors. The king was actually scared of them. He was a spineless rascal named Zedekiah. But he didn't stop them from mistreating God's man for saying things that they didn't want the king to hear. David, on the other hand, here, is acknowledging and highlighting the difference between himself and the people who are persecuting him, the people who are chasing him, Absalom perhaps, and Ahithophel and his cronies, the guys that want to take his place by force. You see, he says here, those who are are seeking him, those who are chasing him, they're only willing to trust God as long as what God says is what they want to hear. And so you could put the word trust sort of in quotation marks in your mind. That's that's not really trust, is it, Jimmy? If I only trust you as long as you say what I want to hear. That's not not trust. That's not even really self-affirmation. That's just ego. But verse 4, you look at verse 4 and he, he says at the beginning, they only consult That is, they only listen to God, they only trust God to cast him down from his high position. They're only willing to listen to God as long as God is saying what they want to hear. And when he doesn't say what they want to hear, what do they do? Go on in verse 4, he says, they delight in lies. And they speak and they act according to what they think is needed in the moment. See, here's, here's the... Here's the temptation for Christians. We can be pressed. We can feel ourselves in a kind of a tight spot. Somebody challenges us. Well, why don't you do so and so? Or why don't you believe this and that? We don't really enjoy being challenged, most of us. We believe what we believe and we just assume that the world goes along with us because that's the society we've grown up in for the most part. And somebody comes along and tries to just turn over the whole, the whole system and that's not very comfortable, is it? It can be t- in that moment for a Christian to speak out or to act out not in a godly way but, but in the same voice, in the same Manner with the same attitude as the, as the person that's challenging us. You know, somebody hits you, what's your instinctive reaction? And we'll hit them back. If you have siblings, you understand what I mean. 
Junior slaps Sissy on the back of the head and Sissy's gonna, gonna knock his lights out. All you have to do is ask Cliff, he'll tell you. It can be very tempting to respond in the same way. See, that's what the evil people did to David. They did what they thought was needed in the moment, verse 4 at the end of the verse. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. What they say outside and what they say inside, what they're doing and saying and what they're thinking are two different things. That's why they were attacking David, because he didn't represent what they wanted. Look at verses 3 and 4. Compare that. He says here in verses 3 and 4, they only consult to cast him down from his high position. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth and curse inwardly. And then compare that with what uh, Absalom said to the people. Take your Bible and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 15. 2 Samuel chapter 15, and we'll start down here at verse 2. And go down to verse 6. There, Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way of the gate. He would go out into the public place. And as people were coming with an issue, with a challenge for the king to to adjudicate, for the king to settle between them, we've got a a conflict, a problem. Absalom would stand out there and say, well, now, hey, what's, what's the problem, fellas? Tell me about this. And so... He, he would, would uh, go out there and get in the way. He would interfere for his own benefit. When any man had a dispute to come before the king for judgment, Absalom would call to him and say, from what city are you? Where'd you come from? And when he said, your servant is of such and such a tribe in Israel, Absalom would say to him, see, your claims are good and right. Now, wait a minute, he's only heard one side of the story. And he's already decided, you're the right guy. You're in the right. You ought to, everything ought to go your way. He hasn't heard the other side of the story. But there's no man designated by the king to hear you. Then Absalom would say, oh, that I were judge in the land. Then every man with a dispute or cause might come to me And I would give him justice. And whenever a man came near to pay homage to him, he would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. And thus Absalom did to all of Israel who came to the king for judgment. And so Absalom did what? Absalom only heard one side of the story and he gave judgment there. He he just told the people what they wanted to hear. And Absalom treated them like they were the, the only person worth considering, like there couldn't possibly be another side to this dispute. And what was Absalom actually doing? All of Israel came to the king for judgment. Absalom treated them this way, and so Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. You're right. You're absolutely right. It's, it, everything ought to go your way. You ought to get exactly what you want. You're right. You're absolutely right. Everything ought to go your way. You ought to get exactly what you want. Wait a minute. What if these two are the, the combatants in the dispute? <laughs> Never mind. He told each one what they wanted to hear. So you see, they're saying here in Psalm 62, verses 3 and 4, they're only saying what suits their purpose in the moment. Contrast that with David, verses 1 and 2. What does David say? Silently my soul waits for God. My salvation comes from Him. He's my rock. He's my salvation. He's my defense. I will not be greatly moved. See, David's depending on God to determine the right thing for him to do. He's not going to to say or to do just according to what's in the moment. Silence in this moment occupies center stage for him. Silence makes us uncomfortable, doesn't it? Silence catches our attention and, and... 
and we're not always comfortable with it. But David's waiting for God. We can, we can get into a situation like this and be very, very tempted. Oh, I've got to do something. I've got to do anything. I don't know if it's the right thing or the wrong thing, but I've got to do something. Can't just sit here. Well, why not? When it's a matter of what's the right thing to do, when it's a matter of what has God told us we ought to do, we need to let him speak. It can be very tempting for us to, well, we've got to do something, got to do anything uh, whenever we feel threatened, whenever we feel attacked for some reason. And David, surely David must have felt that need too. He's just as human as we are. But what does he do here? Look at verses 1 and 2 again. He's disciplining himself. He's controlling himself. Do you suppose he was afraid? Well, they ran him out of his own palace. He's running for his life. Yeah, I think he's a little bit concerned. But he's not going to let that control the moment. He disciplines himself to be content with God's control of the situation. You know, David knows very well, I'm a, I'm a man of blood. I'm a warrior. I, I'm a man who's done things I'm not proud of doing. I, I've been ashamed of myself more times than I want to admit. But I'm not going to shame myself in this situation. Whatever God decides to do with this is all right with me. That's exactly what Jesus did. Think about the trials that he endured when he was slandered and falsely accused and, and blasphemed and cursed. Think about his experience on the cross that, that, that David described so, so vividly this morning. In Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7 He's, he's the, the lamb that's led before the shearers and, and doesn't say a word. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, when he's reviled, remember that's, that's the thief that didn't give up, that just kept right on cursing him. But Jesus didn't do that. When he was reviled, he did not revile again. When the, when the mockers, the ignorant folks, stood at the foot of the cross and said, if he's really the Son of God, let him come down, uh, he, he didn't throw that back at them. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. See, David is a, a figure of the Christ in that. It can be very easy for us to want to fight fire with fire when somebody challenges our values, our choices, ultimately challenges our choice of faith. You know, there are more than a few people in the world that think that we're stupid for believing in God in the first place. And it can be easy to really be irritated, not just irritated, but downright angry when somebody mocks you for that. But we don't fight fire with fire. Who do you really trust? See, that's what this comes down to. In that moment, who am I going to trust? Myself? We're God. When you look at Psalm 62, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, what David is, is showing us here is the peace, the, the assurance that comes when we commit ourselves to trust in God. We're not going to worry about it anymore because we're committed to this way. But the next thing, go on and look at verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. The next thing that, that David shows us, you can almost see, in a sense, he's talking himself into calmness here. Verses 5 through 8, he's showing his confidence 
for refuge, his confidence of refuge in God. And, and, and again, he's, he's stressing his confidence in God. My soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation or my hope is from him. He only. Do you notice how often that word only comes up in this psalm? Go back to verse 2. He only is my rock and my salvation. He only, verse 6, is my rock and salvation, my defense. I shall not be moved. He alone, same concept, same word actually in Hebrew. David is expressing his confidence in God, and it's not blind faith. You don't believe in God just jumping out on, on a limb hoping that he's there. It's, uh, faith in God is not a leap into the dark. Faith in God is trust because of the evidence all around us. David's confident that God's going to take care of him, that he'll deliver him from this situation too. Now he doesn't know how that's going to happen. Maybe he's going to die, and, and that's okay. If he does, he's going to die faithful to God. Maybe God's going to deliver him, to save him from Absalom. And that'll be okay too, and he'll praise God for that. God's always delivered him before. Go back to 1 Samuel, and in chapter 17, verse 36, when David is just a, just a young man, a teenager perhaps, he's in the court of King Saul, and he's talking with King Saul about the threats of, of the Philistine giant, Goliath. And the king is asking, well, who do you think you are to fight him? And, and what does David say in verse 36? He says, the Lord has delivered me from the lion and from the bear. God has been with me in these scraps, in these struggles, in these conflicts with wild animals. Well, this, this, this Philistine's no different. That's the gist of what he's saying. What David is doing here is reminding himself, verses 6 and 7, of his commitment think about this very carefully about the way that we say this. David is reminding himself of his commitment to trust in God. His commitment to trust in God. See, trust is not some, some nebulous uh, thing that you just sort of feel and it, it comes to you. Trust is a deliberate choice. And David deliberately chose to trust God. He made a commitment. He made a, a dedication, as it were. He, he decided, he made a, a choice that I am going to live this way. Does he have moments he has to remind himself of that? Yeah. So, sometimes things are hard. And we need to be reminded, you know, when things get hard, we need to remember, it's not just I trust God, I have chosen to trust God. I've made that commitment. And so, because of that, you look at verse 8, and what does he do? He encourages those who are with him. David wasn't all by himself. He did have some folks with him. And he encourages those who are with him and those who weren't but should have been with him to do the same thing. Look at verse 8 again. Trust in him at all times, all you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. One of the characteristics of genuine trust is this willingness to pour out your heart to God. Your willingness to, to express to God, you've always been there for me. Here's what I need. What did Jesus teach the disciples in, in the the model prayer in Matthew chapter 6. 
Take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 6 and look with me there in verses 9 through 13. Matthew chapter 6, right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. What does Jesus say? Now, uh, don't be like the Gentiles. They think they'll be uh, heard because they repeat themselves, basically, in verse 7. Don't be like them. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. Well, then why should we ask him? Because he said to. When you pray, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. What's Jesus teaching the disciples there? Trust God. Put your faith in Him. Likewise, Peter in, in 1 Peter chapter 5 says in verses 6 and 7, uh, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that He may in due time exalt you. And then what does He say? Cast all your cares. Put all your cares upon him. He cares for you. David's focus here is on God's dependability. He never, ever lets his people down. Even when times might seem frightening and discouraging, he never lets us down. So he says, I've made this commitment. I've reminded myself of this commitment. I'm going to keep this commitment to trust God. But then the third part of this psalm really is, is a message. Verses 9, 10, 11, and 12. It's a, a message for David, for himself. He's reminding himself of these things. But it's a message for all others too. Look at verse 9. The help that, that this world offers has no substance to it. Surely men of, men of low degree are a vapor and men of high degree are a lie. You know, if, if, if you think a guy is, is, a, is a low down dirty skunk, he's no different than a guy that, that's, that's, that's high born and, and thinks he's better than everybody else. They're, they're what? They're men. They're equal before God. If they're weighed on the scales, <laughs> They weigh the same, which is nothing. They're altogether lighter than vapor. They don't have any substance to the help that they offer if God is not part of the picture. The reason in, in verse 10 is because the, the worldly way of doing things is to always, in the end, go down to, well, the end justifies the means. Who cares? Who cares how it gets done as long as we get done what we want? That's the reasoning of the world. That's how the world takes care of its problems. And the point is that who we trust, who we trust makes all the difference when it comes to dealing with the, the problems, the challenges, the difficulties of our lives. Folks who commit themselves to living without God's direction end up trusting and end up trusting in anyone and anything, really everyone and everything except God. Well, guess what? If you put your trust in me, I'm going to let you down sooner or later. If you put your trust in Paul Lyons, sooner or later he's going to let you down. If you put your trust in Anthony Ravenel or David Gulledge or Wayne Nash or Greg Curtis, sooner or later, every one of us is going to let you down. But if you put your trust in God, he'll never let you down. What this psalm shows us in verse 1, in verse 2, in verse 5, in verse 6, in verse 7, verse 8, verse 11, verse 12 is that the true disciple trusts only, completely, exclusively in God. And really, that last point 
That's the lesson. That is the point. You see, you live in a world where people trust in everything but God, but in that world where people trust in anything, everything except God, you need to be the people, you need to be the person who trusts only, completely, wholly, totally in God. And that's what David is trying to emphasize to himself and to those who are with him and to anybody, everybody else that will listen. When you have challenges, when you have difficulties, when you have confrontations, who do you trust? Tonight, I want to challenge you to fully, truly, completely trust in God and mark that trust by responding to the invitation that he offers. We sang a a, a little while ago, when the Savior calls, I will answer. Well, how are you going to answer tonight? The Savior is calling. He's calling you, if you're not a Christian, to become a part of his family, to make the good confession of faith, to repent of your sins, to be baptized into Christ, to live a righteous life. He's calling to you, for you, as a Christian, to correct things that are not right, if that's what you need to do, to trust him more fully, if that's what you need to do, to walk with him each day to take advantage of the help that he offers through his people. If we can join with you in prayer now, if we can intercede at the throne of grace on your behalf, that would be our privilege. Jimmy's going to come. We're going to stand together. Let's sing a song of encouragement. If we can serve you, then come now. Now time to for the Lord's Supper. 
Let us pray. Most kind and loving Father, we thank you for this opportunity to remember Christ and his sacrifice. We ask those by the table of the Lord's Supper examine their lives. There be no sin in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we continue in prayer, Father, we thank you for this cup. And Father, we pray that those that are partaking of it can focus their hearts and minds back to the cross, back to your Son and the blood that he shed for each and every one of us and the perfect sacrifice that he was. Let them take it in a manner that is well pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Most kindly, Father, we thank you for the many blessings you stored upon us. We ask that the monies that we collect tonight will be used to upbuild that kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. thanking you for this beautiful Lord's Day, and thank you, Father, that we can come and worship you without any outside interference. We're thankful to you, Father, for so many things that you bless us with. You give us so much in this life to enjoy. We thank you for it. We're thankful for the church that meets here. We're thankful for each member that makes up your church. We pray that you'll continue to be with each one of us this week, that we'll have a good week and be able to serve you faithfully all week. We pray also that you'll be with those that's been mentioned being sick, that you'll be with them, that their, some of their good health might be restored. Be with those, Father, that's having procedures this week and those that have the other doctor's appointment, pray that you be with them, that they might get a re good result. Be with us now, Father, as we leave this place. Help us to always remember how great how good you are to us, and forgive us of our sin. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> 